right, good evening, everybody. Let's all stand together and worship the Lord as we sing this first song here tonight. Are you washed in the blood? Let's sing out together. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean or be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood? In the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Amen. Amen. It's good to see everybody this evening. Uh, we're going to open up our service tonight with a word of prayer. I'm going to ask Brother Sam, would you pray for us tonight? As far as announcements are concerned, so... Uh, we hope that you enjoy it this time as our choir sings for you, I Know It Was the Blood.
If you've been saved by the blood of Jesus tonight, say amen. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing about that, keeping with that theme, the blood. There is power in the blood. Let's stand together and sing that song this evening. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? Power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's time. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. All right. Well, uh, I started, uh, preached one uh, message out of our new study. Who can rem- tell me, do you remember what it's on? Our new study, Character Old Testament. Samson, very good. I'm glad Lester's paying attention. Amen. Uh, we're looking at Samson. He was physically strong, uh, but spiritually weak. Um, in the first lesson we did, uh, Judges chapter 14, if you're uh, looking in your Bible, in the first lesson that we did a few weeks ago, we looked at the uh, revelation of God uh, that he had given uh, to Samson's parents of having a, a child, having a son, uh, giving him understanding of how to raise him and, and uh uh, as far as his calling, and uh, he was going to be a judge. And so God reveals that to them uh, and gives them an understanding that as parents, they have the responsibility to raise him right. Amen. And so uh, we looked at all those things as far as the revelation of God concerning this coming judge. This week, we're going to be looking at when this judge, Samson, first fell in love. I'm glad we got our teenagers in here this evening. I'm going to be talking a little bit about dating and marriage. Uh, And the reality is, if uh, you say, what does marriage have to do with me? Well, if you're not ready for marriage, then you're not ready to date. Amen and hallelujah. Uh, But this week, we're going to be looking at when Samson first fell in love. There are actually uh, a fair amount of debates going around concerning Uh, through biblical scholars concerning this section of Scripture, verses 1 through 5, specifically verse number 4, which we will uh, get to in a bit. Uh, But for the life of me, I can't figure out why there's any debate because there's only one side of the the opinions uh, that that make any sense that, that, uh, that are consistent with Scripture. So tonight I'm going to be addressing... It from that position, what I uh, believe is the most consistent with Scripture, uh, and that'll make sense as we get along in this. So, uh, Judges chapter number 14, starting in verse 1. And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman of Timnath of the daughter of the Philistines. Who are the Philistines? They are the sworn enemy of the children of Israel. This is the this is the children of the enemy. It's kind of a uh, 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 an interesting story, the way that this all unfolds. But he, he sees this woman who is a daughter of the Philistines, and he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughter of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. 
Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of, the, uh, of thy brethren or among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. But his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines, for at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Then went Samson down his, uh, and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyard of Timnath, and we'll stop there. As we see this unfolding, we see uh, this individual we were introduced to uh, concerning his coming. And, and remember, uh, almost a third of the verses written uh, in the story of uh, Samson are recorded in the, uh, the revelation of God uh, sending this judge and bringing this judge upon the scene. And so uh, he, he, he didn't happen by accident. This wasn't a, uh, just an occurrence that took place. This was a man that is blessed from God. Uh, even before his birth. And so uh, God uh, being with him and God using him in a great and an awesome way, we know, and it'll, it will, I'll remind you of this at the end, that just because God uses an individual or a circumstance doesn't mean that everything that they have done is right in his eyes. And that's what we're going to see taking place throughout the entirety of our look at the life and legacy, really, of Samson, who was so physically strong, strongest man in history, but so very spiritually weak. We know the, uh, and we'll rehearse it later on, the story of uh, Samson and who's the woman he had fallen in love with uh, that cut his hair, Delilah. This is a totally different woman we're looking at this evening, and, and we can recognize through, uh, through the handful of verses that are revealed to us that Samson had a problem with women. Not an uncommon problem, especially in the day in which we live. But we need to understand a handful of things concerning uh, this, uh, this judge uh, appointed of God, blessed of God, his life and his actions. We recognize first the pursuit of this romance as he has fallen in love with a woman. The reason for this pursuit, what is the reason that he tells mom and dad, I want you to go fetch her, bring her back so that we can get married. And obviously they live in a different day. This wasn't uh, the, the way things would go in, this, in the customs and the time period here uh, was that a mother and father would go to the mother and father of a uh, of someone that uh, uh, that they wanted their child to marry, and they would offer them different kind of gifts and seek for the uh, for the permission for their child to marry the other child. And so that's why Samson went and said, uh, "Mom and Dad, I want you to go and see this woman. I want you to go get her, bring her back because I want to marry her." He fell in love with her. It was it was literally love at first sight. Kind of like Jamie with me, right? Actually, it was the other way around. Um, fell in love immediately. But it was love at first sight. The, the, but it was, it was very shallow. Really, what we can recognize here is after Samson sees this woman, it doesn't even tell us that he had a single conversation with her. He didn't go to her and ask her about her family uh, lineage, didn't ask her about her, her, her spiritual condition, didn't uh, want to find out anything about her. All it tells us is that he went to this uh, town, uh, Timnath, which was about five miles from his hometown, and he sees this woman of the daughter of the Philistines, and upon looking at her, he is absolutely smitten. You don't know what that word smitten is, do you? Amen. He... he uh, he is taken back. He, he finds her absolutely striking, and when he looks upon her, he, his desire is for marriage. But really, it goes further than that, and we don't have to get into great detail to understand the uh, kind of the things that are going on here, but we recognize that the reason for his pursuing after her is based on lusting over her appearance. 
doesn't tell us exactly how she looked. It doesn't tell us what she was wearing or what was happening. Uh, when he saw her, all it tells us is that upon looking at her, he is taken back at her beauty, and his desire is to make her his bride. Understand this, especially young folks and Isaiah. Amen. There's a lot more to marriage and happily ever after than just appearance. Um, I'm thankful I don't have to worry about that because Jamie is good looking. Um, but the reality is there is a lot more to uh, holy matrimony than just appearance. He's lusting after her. His desire uh, is for her to be his. And the reality is his reason for pursuing after her isn't because uh, uh, he can see them uh, making a family and living happily ever after or uh, in wedded bliss. He's not concerned about uh, what the Lord uh, uh, could do with their life. And remember, he's a person that is called and set aside of God before he's even born. And he's not even taking into consideration how she can affect his ministry. I'm worried about his man, she's good looking and I want her to be mine. It's lacking in anything spiritual. And it tells us that she is a daughter of the Philistines. Again, the sworn enemy of the children of God. We'll see in a few moments how, uh, looking back, how, how, how the children of Israel have had continual dealings with uh, the Philistines and how they've uh, brought so much turmoil and so much heartache to the children of Israel and how God had used them time and time again, the Philistines, uh, uh, to, to judge, to bring about judgment upon the children of Israel for their disobedience. I mean, things are, are, are rough. The, the relationship between the Israelites and the Philistines is not a good one. And yet, that's where Samson, the judge of the people of God, this man set aside before birth, the strongest man in history, where is he looking for a date? Among the, amongst the enemy. We can recognize a handful of things going on here. The pursuit of this romance, we see the reason for this pursuit, but we can also recognize rebellion in this pursuit. Children of Israel, Samson being a judge as an as a Israelite, we know that God has given a multitude of different uh, instructions concerning uh, marrying as, they, as they've gone into different uh, countries and as they've uh, inherited the promised land, God gives a multitude of different uh, instructions concerning who it is that's acceptable to date and who's not acceptable to date. This isn't a matter of color of skin. This is creed. This is, uh, this is uh, the religion of the people. His desire is that the pagan religions of these uh, of these folks doesn't creep into the children of Israel, which it happened over and over and over again, and it continually caused problem after problem after problem. Here's what God says, Exodus chapter 34, starting in verse 12, take, uh, says, Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land where uh, whither thou goest, lest it be a snare to you, uh, to uh, snare in the midst of thee. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, cut down their groves. For thou shalt worship no other god. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a-whoring after the, their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one uh, call thee, and uh, thou eat of, the, of his sacrifice. And thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a-whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a-whoring after their gods. You say, that's, there's some strong language in, in those verses. Well, the, the reality of what's taking place here is God is giving them an understanding of just how important of a message this is. 
when you go into this uh, promised land, when you go into this uh, place uh, as an inheritance, uh, uh, understand that, that the part of the reason I'm giving you this land is because of the blessing that's upon you. But I'm also taking it away from them because they, uh, they don't serve me. They don't worship me. They, uh, they, they follow after all these false gods. So uh, you going is a part of the blessing, but uh, you driving them out is a part of the judgment upon these people. And here's what I don't want to happen. I don't want you to go into this pagan land and allow the, uh, the, 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 the disdain and, and the worship of false gods and all these wicked and evil things that these people are a part of. I don't want you to start accepting it as normal. and I don't want you uh, to start adapting to them and allowing them to be a part of, uh, of who you are and the life that you live. Don't let the influence of the world rub off on you. That's a message that still rings true today. We are strangers and pilgrims. If you're a child of God, say amen. This world is not our home. We are strangers and pilgrims, and we have the responsibility, personal responsibility, of not letting the wickedness of this world, the filth of this world, rub off on us. So we're to do everything that we can uh, to ensure that that doesn't take place. And part of that is uh, is, uh, uh, here in Exodus is uh, God's telling them, don't uh, don't join yourself to them. Don't uh, join in what they're uh, taking part in. Don't sacrifice. Don't eat what they're sacrificing. Don't let your daughters or your sons marry into their families because it's going to cause problems, and those problems will be generation after generation until you recover from them. Deuteronomy chapter 7, starting verse 3. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter shall not give unto his son, nor his daughter shall thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods, So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, destroying thee suddenly. 1 Kings chapter 11. We remember King Solomon. Samson's the wisest man, or the strongest man in history. We know Solomon being the wisest man in history, asking God for wisdom and how to lead the people, and as a result... Uh, God blesses him with wisdom beyond compare. And yet even the smartest man in history had a problem with women. 1 Kings 11, 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughters of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Hittites, of the nations uh, concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after other gods or after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses. That's too many mother-in-laws, right? Let alone too many wives. Amen. 700 wives, princesses, 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. God gave warning. Children of Israel did not heed this warning. Even the smartest men in history are pretty dumb, amen? He didn't heed. He didn't listen to. He didn't respond uh, in an accurate and and a perfect uh, way to the warning that God had given. And not only did he take one wife of the heathen nation, but he took multiple wives. 
And it cost him greatly. At the end of his life, the smartest man in history did some of the dumbest things that this world has ever seen. New Testament says this, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial, the devil, the enemy of the soul of humanity? Or what part hath a believer with an infidel? Now, this not being not unequally yoked, it, it does make reference to, uh, you can apply it to, uh, to uh, uh, going into business with someone or, or something like that, but, but it's definitely making reference to uh, uh, the covenant of marriage. Children of God, young people, children of God have no business dating and no business marrying unbelievers. It's not, a, it's not an opinion. It's not just me being old school. This is a warning that God gives. It will lead you into a world of hurt and a world of trouble. I can't tell you how many folks that I've uh, witnessed to or uh, even um, folks that, that had already been married or that were thinking about getting married and, uh, and based, on, uh, based on time of counseling, they, it was revealed that they, they were lost. And a believer was planning on marrying an unbeliever. Oh, well, we've known each other our whole lives we have the same ideals and we have the, the same goals. Not if you're a child of God and they're not. As a child of God, your goal should be to bring glory to, and honor to God in everything that you do, to serve Him and to worship Him both uh, personally, publicly, the way that uh, you carry yourself, the things that uh, uh, you do for recreation, the, raise that, uh, the way that you raise your children. It should be all to the glory of God. And that is not the goal or ambition of a lost individual. What fellowship hath light with darkness? Understanding that where light exists, darkness cannot. What communion hath light with darkness, I should say? What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What concord? In what way does Christ and the devil get along? Or what part hath a believer with the infidel? Be not unequally yoked. By the way, like I've already said, if they're not worthy of you marrying them, they're not worthy of you dating them. We see rebellion as Israelites because we know God had given this command to the children of Israel. Those were just a handful of the occasions and when this was brought up. But it's also rebellion on his part, Samson's part, as a Nazarite. If you remember, he is to be set apart. He is to be uh, consecrated and set aside for the purpose of God using him. Uh, a Nazarite vow is something that was very serious. They had the responsibility of living up to the standard of life that God had set for all of humanity, plus a handful of things. And we'll look more at those as we go further in our study. Uh, but here's what it says in uh, uh, Numbers chapter 6, verse 2. This is a, uh, uh, Numbers chapter 6. We see God's, uh, God's calling or God's uh, requirements of those who take a Nazarite vow. He says, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When either, uh, when either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord. So not only are they uh, they're, they're living in rebellion to the commands of God, not only is Samson rebelling against uh, the requirements of a child of God, uh, uh, one of the children of Israel, but he's living in opposition and in rebellion to the, the calling on his life. Because he's not just supposed to live uh, that basic standard baseline of life, uh, that standard of, uh, of holiness and righteousness and consecration. He is to live even a step above that. And he's willingly throwing that away because, man, she looks good. Right? 
this still, this still applies to the young folks. But how about this, Christian? The things we look at on our phone, things we look at in magazines, the things we look at on the computer, the things we look at on our television screens or uh, in a movie, whatever the case may be, what are we willingly forfeiting? Because we're indulging in the lusts of the flesh. And this doesn't just apply to men. We live in a day where women are just as perverted as men are. Amen? Giving themselves over and uh, forfeiting their, their, their purity, forfeiting their usefulness in the hands of God, all because they see something that they desire. Because they see something that looks good and they want it. goes even a step further. This is rebellion as an Israelite. This is rebellion as a Nazarite. Take on a woman of the Philistines to wife. It's also rebellion as an obedient child. We teach kids in junior church. One of God's big ten. Exodus 20, verse 12, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord God hath given you. How is this rebellion as an obedient child? Well, it says in verse number 3, as mom and dad are told by their son, Go get this woman, I want to marry her. Parents express their concern. Is there never among uh, a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all thy people, all my people, that thou goes to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? Mom and dad are asking, why is it you're looking in the wrong place? Why are you even entertaining the idea of taking a bride from this forbidden people group? This sworn enemy of, uh, of your family, is there not uh, people that you can choose from right here? They're expressing their concern. They're giving them the understanding that they don't approve in any way. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16, Honor thy father and thy mother as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Going to the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 1, uh, verse 1, children obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise. So we see his reason for pursuing is based on lust. He's looking in the wrong place, lacks anything spiritual or anything uh, deep. or, or uh, um, It's very superficial. But he wants to marry her anyway. We see rebellion in this pursuit. He re a rebellion as a child, uh, uh, one of the children of Israel. Rebellion as a Nazarite. Rebellion uh, as an obedient child. And then we see the protest about this romance. Again, mom and dad say, Is there not any one of uh, uh, the daughters of thy brother among the people that goest? Uh, that thou goest uh, to take a wife of these uncircumcised Philistines. Mom and dad, it's our responsibility to guide, direct, be picky, be hard-nosed about who our children associate themselves with, and even further than that, who they date, who they marry. Here, here's the truth. Because it was the parents' responsibility to go to the other parents to, uh, to give them the gift and to request the marriage, if mom and dad had done what they should have done in that moment, it wouldn't have gone any further. It's our responsibility as parents to do our part in sheltering our children, helping them make the right decisions. And when they refuse to, Force the hand. Amen and hallelujah. We see uh, in this protest about the romance, it was a wise prote protest. It was wise in the position that they held. 
the position that they held, it supports the position of God's Word. God God refuses this. God has has told us, He's made it absolutely, abundantly clear that this is a no-no. This is uh, something to avoid at all costs. You are willingly uh, partaking and willingly uh, pursuing after something that God has uh, uh, forbidden us to do. Not only are we bringing displeasure to God, but with that, he gave us warning after warning after warning. And we've seen through the history of our people uh, the heartache that comes as a result of it. And you're willingly pursuing after this. That's foolish, right? They're wise in their position because their position uh, was in support of the law of God. They were wise in their uh, protest and that they were wise in their reasoning. Why do you have to go looking in, in the world? Why do you feel it's necessary to go after uh, when, when the Lord has given us the entirety of the body of Christ? He talks about the children of Israel, uh, women among uh, the daughters of thy brethren and among all my people. He says, why can't you look amongst your own people? Believers, followers. Again, this isn't uh, this isn't uh, this isn't a uh, uh, calling them away from uh, from something simply because of color of skin or a disagreement or uh, a mindset concerning a different kind of people. This is based on what thus saith the Lord. They live in opposition to God. They serve other gods. They worship other gods. They have made themselves enemies of God, and that's who you're going after. Here's an unpopular thing to mention from a pulpit. It's not always God's will for people to get married. If you can't find someone in the body of Christ, one, maybe God, his desire for you is to not marry at this time. Or maybe you're the problem. Maybe you're not living a life that's worthy of, uh, of being uh, accepted in marriage and, and going through the, the vows, that consecration unto God and that, uh, that union before God because why would God allow one of his daughters to marry a backslidden individual or why would God allow one of his sons to marry a backslidden individual? It's not always God's will for people to marry. Number two, it is never his will for a Christian to marry an unsaved person. Never. You don't understand. I love them. Okay? Find somebody else to love. Set your focus somewhere else. How about loving God first and allowing Him to do His work in and through your life and provide for you the spouse that is perfectly fit for you in the ministry God's called you to fulfill? How about marrying someone that, uh, that God is pleased with, that God has provided, someone who's, who, whose goal and ambition in life is, is what it's supposed to be, to bring glory and honor to God and everything. I've said before, uh, the, the key to dating, my, uh, my, my advice to anybody who's, uh, who's in the dating pool is for that individual to run as fast and as hard towards Christ as they possibly can, and if there's a member of the opposite sex that's keeping stride, that's the person for you. It's never God's will for a child of God to marry an unsaved individual. There's no such thing as missionary dating. If it's his will for a person to marry, and we know it's not always his will, but if it's his will for a person to marry, have enough trust and faith in God that he will provide the spouse. Is there not women among the daughters of thy, of thy brethren or among my people? They were wise in their reasoning. They were wise in their position because their position supported uh, 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 the, the law of God. Not only that, they were, 
wise in their language. And that's one that, that I got from a commentary and never even thought of it. But at the end of this, uh, this phrase, uh, are there any among uh, your, your brethren uh, or among my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? This is kind of a derogatory term. But it's a term that is expressing uh, the, their concern uh, as far as this union taking place. This was a term expressing the Philistines. They're being uncircumcised Philistines. This is a term expressing their opposition to God. It's not just that they don't believe in God, that they don't trust in God, that they don't follow after God. They're in absolute opposition to God and His people. It's also a term uh, revealing their pagan beliefs and rituals. This was not just a set of parents that didn't understand their son had fallen in love. They understand. And they call out sin and the resulting danger of pursuing this kind of a relationship. And I know young folks, uh, folks that are in love, they can't see that. Mom and dad are dumb, out of touch with reality. These parents are a lot more in touch with reality than Samson was. You don't understand the danger, the heartache you're setting yourself up for. Recognizing this woman as a, uh, a part of the Philistine people, these uncircumcised Philistines, they are calling out sin. She's pagan. They're calling sin, sin, instead of covering it up or with some kind of flowery language. Which, by the way, is what often we do as a people group. A few examples. Instead of calling something an abortion or murder, which is what it really is, we call it pro-choice or women's health. Right? Right? What the Bible calls adultery, humanity calls an affair, having an affair. Wait, here's the problem with that. Everybody likes going to the fair, amen? When you cover it over or paint it with flowery language, it, uh, it takes away the sting of what it really is. There are some things such as homosexuality, incest, bestiality, the abuse of children that the Bible refers to as an abomination. What does our society call it? An alternate lifestyle. Pornography, filth, perversion, our society calls adult entertainment. Manuel and I were driving down the road the other night. It was late, and I was just looking around and naming off different things that I was seeing to try to keep myself awake. And I come across this one that labeled itself as a gentleman's club. And I, I can tell you there wasn't a single gentleman in there. Just a bunch of people that are perverted and consumed with the lusts of the flesh. What was once recognized and as obvious as a mental illness, society says that that is their identity. Mom and dad don't cover up sin. They call sin what it is. We see the, 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 the reason, we see that they were wise in their protest of this marriage. But unfortunately, it was a weak protest. They talked a good talk. Biblical basis. Uh, calling out sin, the wise in their language, wise in their reasoning. There's plenty of people around here for you to marry. But when it came down to brass tacks, they simply didn't walk the walk. 
Here's what the Bible says took place. Verse number 5. Then went Samson down, him, or uh, his father and his mother, to Timnath, and came to the vineyards of Timnath. Here's what's happened. He's told them, I want to marry them. They said, but there's, there's a problem with that. It goes against God, and it, it, it's setting yourself up for a world to hurt. He says, you don't understand. We're in love. So what do they do in response? They take their son down to the very place where this forbidden woman was for the purpose of seeking after their parents for permission for them two to marry. Mom and dad had compromised. Mom and dad had allowed some things that once they stood against. They had allowed some things that took to take place that they knew was displeasing and forbidden of God. But because their son wanted it and they loved their son, they willingly compromised and allowed, and I'll go ahead and tell you, mom and dad failed at their responsibility, at their job. They failed. They failed Samson. They failed uh, their people. They failed in every way possible. They failed. Real quick, we'll go back and look at just a couple of verses. Or, or one, really. Verse number four. This is the one that I said that uh, uh, there's a bit of a uh, uh, debate over. But his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord. What? The union. Thus he sought an occasion of the Philistines, for at, the, at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. So here's what's taken place. God has uh, revealed and uh, told us right in the middle of this story that, uh, that the parents did not know uh, that God was allowing this thing to take place. We said in the beginning, just because God allows something or just because he uses something doesn't mean that God is okay with what they're doing. Sometimes he uses uh, the wicked. Sometimes he uses those that live in opposition to him to bring chastisement or to bring judgment upon his people. This has been taking place year after year after year for the children of Israel. Were the Philistines who were pagan, uh, false god worshiping uh, heathens, were they pleasing in the eyes of God? No, in no way whatsoever were they pleasing. But God used them, didn't he? The clarification of this plan, uh, here's what it said in Judges chapter 13, verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the for 40 years. So what's the clarification? What is it that this verse is actually saying to us? But uh, saying to us, uh, but his father and mother knew not that it was of the Lord. Clarification of this plan. There's a difference between the perfect will of God and the permissive will of God. God in his sovereignty knew the rebellion that existed in the heart of, of, of Samson. And so knowing, uh, being omniscient, knowing all things, knowing that Samson was going to do what Samson wanted to do, that he was going to follow through with this, that there was no changing his mind, God says, okay, I'll give you over to your desire. I'll give you over to what it is you want more than anything. But understand, it's going to cost you. But in giving him over, he is going to bring about a deliverance for the children of Israel. So God is going to use uh, a person living in rebellion to bring deliverance to a people. God will use us whether we like it or not. Amen. I just hope that he uses me uh, out of obedience rather than disobedience. It was God's perfect will was that Samson be a man of integrity, a man of devotion, that he follow through and be a, uh, an upright citizen and the kind of judge that God could use for years and years and years and in multiple forms and in multiple fashions. But his permissive will says, based on the rebellious heart of Samson, I'll use him despite him.
This was the permissive will of God, not his perfect will. How do we know that? The second point is that God will never lead you to do anything contrary to his revealed word. Never. He will never lead you to marry someone who is unsaved. Never. He will never lead you to step outside of marriage. He will never lead you uh, to divorce. He will never leave you, uh, lead you uh, to stepping outside of church and uh, not darkening the doors any longer. He will not lead you to not give. He will not lead you to not serve. God is not going to lead you to do anything that he has revealed in his word as being an absolute in your life. He will never lead you to do anything contrary to his word. So that's one way that we can uh, understand that this is the permissive will of God and not the perfect will of God. God knew how he would use this, this rebellious heart of Samson. God knew how he would use this marriage, this seeking after this marriage. God knew how he would use this. Samson didn't. Samson didn't have some kind of insight into the future. He didn't have any kind of revelation. It doesn't give us anything that points to that, uh, though there are some that believe, uh, you know, he's following after the, uh, the will of God because it was God's will for him to do this. It's never God's will for us to do the wrong thing. It's never right to do wrong. It's never right to do wrong, even to accomplish what we think is right. It's never right to do wrong. Again, God knew how he would use this, whereas Samson did not. God knew that the children of Israel, after 40 years being under the thumb of the Philistines, 40 years of cruelty and torture, 40 years of judgment at the hand of God, God was going to use Samson, this rebellious judge, to bring the children of Israel out from underneath the Philistines. So here's, that, that's a clarification for this plan. As we see uh, those things unfolding, uh, the parents didn't know, neither did Samson. Here's the caution that goes along with this plan of God. There's some cautions that come along with it. Three things we need to understand, recognize, just because God uses a situation does not mean it's his perfect will. Young people, you can date and marry outside of the will of God and understand part of his permissive will is that once you enter into that covenant of marriage, it is now God's perfect will for that marriage to last. So even if he doesn't treat you the way you thought he would treat you, even if he keeps you from doing what the Lord would have you to do. You've made your bed, you've got to lie in it. It's never God's will. It's never okay with God for you to walk away from a covenant that's made before him. It's a hard reality, it's a hard truth. I went to school with a lot of folks that uh, were called of God to preach his word. Married the wrong young lady. And as a result of marrying the wrong young lady are no longer in the ministry. I went to school with uh, some young ladies that did the same thing. Married the wrong man and as a result they are no longer serving God. Just because God uses this situation doesn't mean that it's a part of his perfect will. Number two, just because God uses a situation doesn't mean that he'll bless it. Perfect example of this can be seen in the New Testament. God's will is that all of mankind fall in obedience and that all of mankind serve and that all of mankind live righteous and holy lives, right? 
We know that Jesus Christ is our perfect example for all of humanity of how we are to live, carry ourselves, uh, what our goals and ambitions should be. Jesus is that perfect example, right? Jesus calls 12 disciples unto himself, and yet one of them was responsible for giving him over to a vicious, murderous crowd of people for the purpose of him being crucified. It was God's perfect will. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's God's perfect will that Judas had had fallen in line and been obedient and loved Jesus. That was the perfect will of God for all of humanity, and it was his perfect will for Judas. But because of Judas's betrayal, because of Judas's rebellion and pride, God uses Judas to accomplish God's purpose for all of humanity. Just because God uses a situation doesn't mean that he's going to bless it. He didn't bless it in the life of Judas. Judas goes out and in bitterness hangs himself. Number three, just because God uses a situation doesn't mean it doesn't come with consequence. All sin has consequence. In the Greek and in the Hebrew, the words that translate to the English word all have the same meaning. All means all, and that's all all means. All. All sin. All sin has consequence. Big sin, little sin, however it is you want to categorize it. The transgression against the will, uh, the, the, the revealed will of God, his plan, his purpose, the breaking of his law. All sin has consequence, and I assure you the consequence the price is much too high of a price. A price you don't want to pay. All sin has consequence. That's the caution in this plan. So through this, we see a, a handful of things. We see his reason for this romance. He's taken back by her beauty, his desires to marry her. He's going to move heaven and earth, do everything he can to make sure that this is accomplished, but he's consumed with lust, he's consumed with pride, he doesn't take into consideration the spiritual uh, ramifications, he doesn't, uh, he's looking in the wrong places, and it's going to cost him. Mom and dad try to give him the warning, avoid it at all costs, but they fell short of, uh, of stopping the marriage, they were willingly, uh, willing participants in it, they, uh, they willingly uh, sought after uh, this woman for, for their son to marry. But again, the, the, the shame and the guilt lays on Samson, who willingly pursued. The problem is all sin comes with consequence. God's going to use Samson. God's going to use this situation in awesome and powerful ways. But at, I'll just go ahead and give you a, a, a look. When you get to the end of Samson's life, he is a prisoner in shackles, grinding as a, as a spectacle in front of people. He's grinding at the mill. His eyes have been plucked out, standing before these people working in shame. This man who is the strongest man in all of history. And it kind of starts off with his rebellion concerning this woman, doesn't it? 